Madame Ravens. This way to the library. She's been expecting you. A Place of Lions, Part 1, by Bear Lair 64. Ah, you big fellers. Thank you so much for easing my passage. Jim looked around at the faces of the old folk of the forest. Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Boogers, whatever one wished to call them. He was sure that he could not pronounce the name that they called themselves. He discovered, though, that they were indeed a people, and quite capable of communication among themselves, and to a limited degree, with him. They seemed to understand him, and as time passed, he began to catch sounds and gestures of theirs that enlightened him to his host's intentions, gave him a peep into the window of their world. I don't know why you decided to let me reside in your fine abode, nor what I may offer of any value as recompense. The big hair suit beings had gathered, as they always did each day, maybe night. He wasn't sure, since they were deep inside a system of natural and booger squatch improved caverns, connected by a tight web of tunnels. They'd placed him in one with a warm spring and a nice hole for the disposal of waste to even deeper climbs. They'd placed fresh vegetation on a platform where he could rest beneath the blankets he'd brought, as he was comfortable as he'd been in hospice. They even brought him food. The space was lit by lichen and fungi that gave off a slight glow that in aggregated provided plenty of light. They did not use fire and did not appear to need it. Air circulated well, perhaps though some opening to the sky far above in the darker portion of the cavern between the stalactites. Perhaps y'all would enjoy a tale? You seem interested in the studying human creatures. I've been all over the world and to places that would leave your ample jowls gaping to behold it. It was dangerous work in wild, savage locales. Environments that were frightening in and of themselves, yet almost always gorgeous, not because of the works of humankind, but because of their lack. Places built by nature. His eyes adopted a faraway stare as he focused on a particularly bright patch of glowing vegetation set among the living stones of the cavern wall. Once upon a time I found myself in the mountains, not tall ones covered in pines like those you call home. These were old and worn to nubs of rock and sand. Little but scrub and grass grew on them, if anything. Yet they teemed with life, especially feral goats and sheep, wild asses, and in the lower elevations, Anatolian bear. Above all, it was a place of lions. He stopped and described lions, so the beings around him might appreciate what large and fearsome beasts they were. He needed them to understand that, one-on-one, -on -one, even they would be faced with a critically dangerous opponent should they encounter such a beast. There were nods and grunts of general agreement, and others of doubt or prideful denial that any wild creature could challenge their ferocity. Jim grinned at his old man's yellowed grin and continued, I went there on behalf of others. You've all seen the flying machines of my people. That's how we travel so far. I was there to sort out some disappearances wrought by wild creatures. No one was sure what they were at the time, only that people disappeared in certain valley more than any other places. There was often blood spore. It was in a part of the world thought long bereft of the king of beasts. We had images from high above that showed ruins in that valley, within the mountains. The valley was green and lush, nothing like the environs that surrounded it, dotted with small trees and tall grass with a small river that would along its nadir. We had no idea what ancient culture the ruins might belong. The first people to disappear under our watch had sought the old palace, 
The entire expedition disappeared despite there being no known predators in the region. Not even the two-legged kind. Then the locals started to disappear in great number, and someone in a small government in that district decided that it must be a large cat escaped from a zoo or menagerie, maybe a tiger. So they hired my company to solve their defense management concerns. And they, in turn, brought in their big cat specialists. Yours truly. Early 1970s CE, in the former province of Galicia. So, how many have gone missing over how long of a period? Jim asked his official appointed guide and liaison. The man looked fit and competent, though he clearly favored the oppressive regime for which he worked. Or so his words often reflected. No doubt he was sincere, since he relied on said regime to supply his position. He was not happy about dealing with the big foreign infidel. There were already too many of those in his country for his taste. We'll estimate 25 to 30 in the past four months. That does not count the archaeology team of 12 at the beginning of the four months. Jim nodded. That's no tiger or single man-eater. They devour plenty, but that's a lot of people meat. You said that. Do you estimate the number? Hamas frowned at the American hunter, assuming the man meant some political trap to insult or harm himself or his government. The local population lives in remote places. The mountains are no place for large cities. Water is too scarce, and the cold winds too bitter for civilized people. We cannot keep account of every person who may dwell in such places. There are greater concerns, yet these people live under our governance, so we owe them protection and a redress of damages done to them. His frown deepened. In any case, no one wishes to see a province disrupted, nor lives wasted unnecessarily. Jim smiled. Good enough. I was simply calculating in accordance with my mission. If humans are scarce on the ground, then the number of missing is downright alarming when compared to the overall population of the area. Since we're provincially eliminating humans in this cause, we have to figure out what could be eating so many two-legged meals. Perhaps you might show me on a map where the disappearances occurred? I am not here to supply you with military-grade maps. You must accept that I will escort you to the place where we should begin the investigation. Hamas bristled. He was sure that the wicked foreign creature was some sort of spy, seeking military intelligence. Jim flashed his strong white teeth. No problem, my friend. I have a map. I simply need you to point. I will make marks as appropriate. As he spoke, he withdrew a detailed satellite map of the broader area. It contained images of the ancient ruins in much more detail than Hamas had seen on the maps produced in his superior nation. After we settle on where we're going, we'll determine what supplies are needed. Fortunately, your government accepted our contract and allowed me to bring my own weapons and personal gear. However, we will need some mundane items and, of course, food and transportation, etc. As Ham... Zah's face clouded further. Jim's lightened. At least we don't have to walk the entire countryside, Jim said in a voice that vibrated with motion. An operation of the antique automobile that had been issued for the expedition. We get to ride in the finest of automobiles. Perhaps later we can rent some asses to complete the trek? Hamza, dour as ever, favored him with his favorite sour expression. I do not understand why we must speak with these rural peasants. We already know the source of the problem and have identified the epicenter as this so-called Palace of Lions. Why do we not proceed directly to the origin? Jim grinned because he knew that his guide hated it when he did so. He did not like to see a happy Jim. We need information about just how many beasts are in the Pride or Pack. If it's not lions, after all, it could be wolves or wild dogs. With as many lost souls as we have, it's clearly more than one beast. 
The ancient site may prove to be what the archaeologists believe, or something older. I, however, will reserve judgment. The people hereabout are possibly descended from the very folk who built the edifice. They could just as easily be descended from later invaders. This part of the world has seen its share of shifting populations. I want to hear about them, their legends, their folk tales. This will give us what we need to address the problem. Hamza's frown managed to deepen, and his brow furrowed to near impossible depths. I do not care for this ancient language you use. Anything before the prophet, he trailed off. There was no use proselytizing to this infidel. The man would only turn it into a jest and laugh at what he should be on his knees to revere. The savages who roam these lands in years gone by are indeed the ancestors of the modern barbarians. They are simple and backwards. You will find nothing useful. It is doubtful they will speak with you at all. They do not care for strangers. Jim continued to grin. Yep, them hill types just don't cotton to strangers. Did I ever tell you about my grandpa Virgil? He was a hill man from the Ozarks, by way of the Cary Mountains. We are grateful that you have come to assist us with the loss of our people, Hunter Jim Broxton. You are welcome to our hospitality, and we will see to your needs. The hetman, Asian, assured the broad-shouldered, friendly American, Come, sit, and we will tell you what we know that will help. Jim was surprised that any of the indigenous spoke English, let alone so well. However, Aslan was a man of means and had studied in Ankara before he returned home to serve his community. He nodded in respect and agreement. My deepest gratitude and regards. We have equipment and supplies. We could use some additional fuel or perhaps the loan of hooved load carriers. Yet we are mostly in need of knowledge. The location of each attack and when each occurred to look for the patterns. The best and safest paths. If there are any with experience of what we might face, we would be greatly assisted by their wisdom. Aslan nodded in turn. We have such available, especially information, for as long as anyone re can recall. We have regarded the boundaries of the place of lions as taboo, off limits. Everyone in this part is taught from an early age that to trespass is to forfeit one's life and to endanger the lives of others. When the archaeologists came, they ignored our warnings and pleas, and penetrated not only the outer perimeter, but the inner sanctum, the old palace. None of them returned, and none will. Unfortunately, it seems that the desecration of the sacred has removed the normal boundaries. The pride of lions has created a new expanded territory, and they defend it fiercely. We don't know for sure, but our hunt scouts have counted around a dozen adult lions. Of course, there are likely more prides that patrol in other directions. Many large predators to keep fed. Jim nodded. You know for sure it's lions? They've supposedly been extinct around these parts for a long time. Aslan nodded. Yes, indeed. We told the officials sent by our government, but they insisted that there was no such lions, and never mind what our people have seen or the tracks they've encountered. We have ever found that some victims may have been led into traps, places where they are easily killed with no chance of escape. Jim frowned. Lions are smart, but it seems like we have some sharper-than-usual kitties out in the local wild places. He looked hard at Hamza. I'm not sure one of my rifles will be able to take out such a large pride. Any thoughts on supporting troops other than your goon squad? None of them appear to be marksmen. Before Hamza could speak, Aslan interrupted. I will attend the hunt with you, Mr. Broxton. At least two others from our village will come with us. He smiled. We are all of us fine marksmen. Jim returned the feral grin. Three watched the intruders as they made camp just outside the territorial line. 
too close in her estimation, yet they seemed to make it a point to look carefully at where they were and to avoid crossing the line. Where the hills ascended towards the overlook of her lush valley, it was a wise move on their part, since night closed in rapidly. She counted nine of them and smelled that they had firearms, the latest threat to her kind. One of the strangers, the tallest, possessed an odd odor. It was strangely pleasant. The rest were standard fare, and when they, at sunrise, attempted to trespass, they would become servants and then food for her pride. She decided that it was time to confer with her sisters and brothers and determine what they should do and when. What the? Hamza sprang from his bedroll into a seated position. The last echoes of the coughing roar of a hunting lion that had found its supper faded rapidly. Must have been a nightmare, he grumbled, and then laid down once again to seek the empty shadowlands of sleep. Then the shouts began, armed sounds meant to awaken the entire camp. He scrambled to get dressed in the dark interior of his tent, when he finally made it to where the others had gathered. He was in a savage mood, until he saw what lay at the feet of the gathered troops. Chunks of meat, splashes of blood, and shreds of khaki uniform material, now stained crimson, but darkened to rust. He was not accustomed to being awakened at odd hours, so his mind churned slowly. What has happened? Who is... Who did this? A tall figure loomed from the deep and wavering shadows, cast by light from the central fire. I know you were rudely awakened, but do you really need to ask? Jim Broxton's voice and demeanor held nothing but humor at the moment. Counting heads, it looks as though we've lost only one. One of yours, Hamza. Our guard of the hour. Ahmed, wasn't it? Perhaps we should have posted two to prevent a stealth attack. Just saying. He had told this fool this would happen, but Hamza was sure he knew best. He hadn't wanted more than one of his soldiers on guard duty at a time, so they would not be fresh in the morning and prepared to face predators. The one who had perished would now be no help, and the team was less prepared overall. I will remain on guard the rest of the night, Hamza proclaimed. I will hear no complaints. It was a good plan. The man may have simply have fallen prey to fatigue and been attacked by wild dogs. He looked meaningfully at Aslan and his hunters, Sahin and Tazi. Perhaps one of you will remain on guard with me? We wouldn't want any of the locals to come near the camp unannounced. As locals yourself, you might be able to recognize them by their smell. He attempted to draw the men into a confrontation to distract from his own incompetence, nearly succeeded. But Aslan had been around enough, officious martinets, to know when to allow them to inflate their own egos. He made a slight gesture to his companions to prevent them from reacting on his behalf, then shrugged. I believe that Tazzy may be willing to assist. He has an excellent nose. Tazzy grinned. He indeed had one of the biggest nose in his village, and he was young and energetic. He did not mind the loss of a couple hours of sleep. Tazzy, seek your bedroll, my friend. Sahin patted the young fellow's shoulder. I'll oh, stay on watch with the wise one. He flicked his chin to indicate the broad back of Hamza, who sat facing the opposite direction, clearly dozing on duty. Dazzy smirked and thanked his friends before he sought the last snatch of sleep. It would soon be time for the party members to rise, and he trusted Sahin to remain alert and watch over the entire camp. Indeed, Sahin watched. Out in the darkness, he saw dark figures moving against the slate colors of the nightscape. The moon had long set, he did not expect that there would be another attack. The lions had sent their message that the party should return and leave. He would normally have been in favor of that option, yet one of the recent victims was his cousin. 
There was no blood spore when she disappeared, only hints of pug marks and scratches on the hard ground and torn piece of garment. His desire to support his family honor had caused him to join Aslan, and his friendship with that worthy and... Tazzy ensured that he remained determined to complete the goal, to stop the attacks. He wondered briefly how the lions had removed the sentry without alerting the camp. It was the dead man's relief who found his remains and raised the alarm. As he pondered the events, he noted that one of the shadows had approached much closer than the others. He focused on the dark form. It did not resolve into anything recognizable until it was close enough to spring. He knew it was a lion and he should sound off for the others, yet something about the slow manner of the approach and the creature's disregard of any threat he might pose caused him to hesitate. He noted that the eyes of the beast blazed like twin golden-green flames that burned inside the too high forehead of the carnivore. The orbs danced enticingly, and he was soon mesmerized by the intricate but repetitive motions. His conscious perception began to recede in his subconscious dream state to advance. He remained awake, but his will was gradually sublimated to that of the creature. No, the being that now panted hot, fetid breath into his face. You must have been asleep! If not, Sahin would still be here, would be alive. Instead, there's only blood, blood that should be yours! Tazzy lunged toward Hamza, but Jim and Aslan restrained him. Two of the troops assigned to guard the official interspersed themselves between their charge and the angry young hillman. Hamza seethed. I was not asleep. Your friend simply abandoned us. There's not enough blood to indicate he was killed. His footprints led away from the camp. He walked of his own accord, likely back to a squalid hut. Nothing dragged his corpse. Jim patted Tansy's shoulder. He has a point, Tassie. He looked hard at Hamza. He didn't have to be so rude in making it, but the logic is sound. Sahin walked away from the camp. However, he did not walk towards home. He walked towards the old palace complex. We are going that way. We will look for him as we go. Tazzy relaxed and stepped back from Hamza. The tension in the group relaxed with him, and they soon resumed their journey. It would take most of the day, even using the old military-style truck they'd brought. They had sufficient fuel and, su and supplies to carry them the distance. Yet after a certain point, there was no road or trail or track that was passable except on foot. They would not reach the ruins before late the next morning. The drivers had to go slow as the ground became rougher and steeper. They'd been on track for less than three hours when the trail ahead was blocked by piles of rock and sand and scrub from a landslide. There was no telling when the event had occurred that caused the roadway to be covered so thoroughly. Once the dust settled, it would look the same for hours or decades. Looks like we hoof it from here forward, Jim announced unnecessarily. He glanced around at Hamza and his three remaining soldiers, and at the two villagers whom he decided he liked. It will be tough going with the packs we have to carry. We must take plenty of water and enough blankets to keep us warm. Pack light, freeze at night. I won't share my gear with anyone who carries a lighter load. He grinned as he made his pronouncement. Aslan and Tazzy smiled as they hefted their heavy packs. Hamza, no surprise, wore a dour expression. Yet he and his henchmen added extra water and blankets to their loads. As far as Jim was concerned, they didn't have to be happy. They needed only to follow directions and perform their duties so that the entire team might survive. They climbed past the obstruction, then picked up the pathway on the other side. It was rough going, but easy enough to mark the trail. There were no tall trees, yet there were plenty of indicators in the landscape that people accustomed to traveling in 
Unpopulated areas could follow with ease. Jim caught Hamza glancing nervously about. He was not such a well-traveled person. Don't worry, you won't get lost as long as we three make it out to guide you back home. He worked his head to indicate Aslan and Tazzy as he spoke. It wouldn't hurt to remind the Delante that he was in the hands of experts, and that he had better ensure that those experts were kept from harm. As they progressed, the rolls in the hills stopped, and the grade turned into a steady climb with a sharper rise constantly on the horizon. The peaks around them crowded and glowered at trespassers, as did other eyes. Three looked with pleasure on the interlopers. They made it to their next encampment with nothing but fatigue to plague them. They were clearly wary of their surroundings, as they should be. Six and seven had taken up positions in the surrounding rocks. Old Eight would arrive soon. She was the one who placed the latest captive under control of her mind. She was best in the pride at mesmerizing. They would need her for tonight's plan. They would deplete the resources and thus the strength of the intruders and set them against one another with suspicion. Old Eight would need only to capture thoughts of one of them, and the man-thing of the slave folk would do the rest. Malik had drawn first watch with Koyan as his partner. He was satisfied enough. At least he was done. He could sleep through the night. Eske and the village man named Aslan would take the second watch. He was resentful that the big American Dumas <laughs> pig was not scheduled for a watch, especially since the man bragged about how he could handle the large caliber rifle he lugged along with his enormous pack. Malik held no trust in any but himself when it came to martial affairs. Now he paced the perimeter of the camp in the gloom of night. Koyan was seated on a high rock, focused on anyone or anything that might approach from the shadows. Wait. He paused in thought and stride. There's something out there in that patch of scrub. The foreign hunter's big hand snapped shut on Malik's wrist, which, while thick, was no match for the steely grip and sudden twist that locked the joints of his arm in a painful position. What is it you want, soldier boy? The large man rasped. His voice still rusted with sleep and the dry climate. Malik reflectively tried to pull away from the pain and arrested motion. Ah! He let out a choked sound as his bones and nerves ground together. The noise awakened Tazzy and Aslan, who slept nearby. What has happened, friend Jim? the hetman inquired in a low voice. Seems this fellow wants a drink of my water. Perhaps the entire canteen. What happened, big guy? You forgot to pack enough of your own? Jim assumed that the man must have ignored his warning at the outset or been offended by it and wanted to teach him a lesson. He knew Malik's name, but the man had stared daggers at him from their first encounter and Jim fully reciprocated the obvious distaste. When Malik did not respond, Jim slammed his wrist down and used the motion to apply his weight to the maneuver, even as he rose. He brought the wrist with him and continued the torque through the joint, the man's arm, and create more discomfort, more pain, and the incapability of motion, other than what he required from the goon. I've asked nicely as I'm going to, Rockhead. What are you doing? What have you been up to? The commotion and the fact that Jim had raised his voice to a near shout awakened Hamza and Desek, who approached the tableau wearily and sluggish of mind. What is this? What are you doing to Malik? Let go of my man this instant. To most, he would have sounded authoritative and strong. Many people would have complied instantly with the barked command. However, Jim wasn't like most. This Domus attempted to steal my canteen. I want to know why. For that matter, the rest of you should probably check your own supplies. It took several moments to resolve, but the members of the shrinking group 
soon discovered that Malik's canteen and those of Hamza, Koyan, and Essek were missing from their immediate vicinity. They quickly located the containers, though the contents of each had been poured onto the ground, where it was rapidly absorbed. What they did not find was Koyan, nor any sign of the man. His rifle was left behind on the boulder where the man had perched. So, quote, this raven... Thank you so kindly for stopping by my chateau, my darlings. It does mean so much to me. Please, if you have not subscribed, as many of you have not, please do so. Give me a like so I know what you would like to hear. And comment. I always love to read your comments. And special thanks to my Patreon and membership supporters. Ciao, darlings.